This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. A British military hero who is motivating wounded veterans on both sides of the pond. From the UK, David Wiseman on this edition of Conversations. Captain David Wiseman was shot in the chest in 2009 by the Taliban while serving in Afghanistan with the British Army. Wiseman was critically wounded, but like most heroes, Wiseman found a way to make the most of a challenging situation. He's climbed mountains, written a book, and competed in athletic endeavors. His positive energy serves him well as head of armed forces programs for the Royal Foundation of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and Prince Harry. Mr. Wiseman has been invited to the United States to explore efforts to improve the lives of the armed forces community. We're pleased to welcome Captain David Wiseman to this edition of Conversations. Thank you for joining us. Jeff, thank you very much for uh, inviting me on your show. Tell me more about your mission here in the United States. Well, um, I've been very kindly invited over to the USA by your State Department. Um, it's a program called the IVLP, the International Visitors Leadership um, Program, and it's been running for several decades now. And uh, the, the, the overarching mission of the program from the State Department's point of view is to establish positive connections with um, people all over the world uh, so that those connections, um, as, uh, as for example, that my career progresses, um, uh, uh, that I have a very positive outlook of, of, of the USA. And I have to say, I've been here in America now for, for two weeks. I've got a further week. Um, I have spent time in, uh, or I will spend time in five cities. Um, DC, LA, uh, New Orleans, here in Pensacola, and I finish up in Boston. And it's been a, it's been a wonderful um, learning experience for me. And that's really my goal. The goal, as I said before, from the State Department is to create those connections around the world. My goal um, over here is to really learn and en enhance my own professional expertise on um, how best to um, uh, engage with and uh, create positive advances for the armed forces community. As you travel around the nation, around the United States, and, and meet uh, the various uh, veterans who have participated in our armed forces, what's your experience been like with those? It's been an incredible experience. I mean, um, uh, my experience as a soldier, um, uh, I spent a tour in, in, in Baghdad, up in, uh, in, in Iraq, and, uh, and I spent a tour in, in Afghanistan, in Helmand province, uh, Nadi Ali district, um, down in southern Afghanistan. On both those tours, I served alongside um, uh, American soldiers um, and uh, uh, American um, service personnel, and that was always a positive experience, and that has continued um, on this trip as well. And it's been, as I say, an incredible learning experience, mainly because I would say um, you guys over here have such a, a different system um, uh, compared to ours in the United Kingdom. You have um, a, a veterans agency, a single point of contact in, in your government that's responsible for, um, for your, uh, for your uh, armed forces veterans. We don't have that in the UK. We've got a different system. And I'm not saying one is better or, or one is worse, but it is different. Um, when, when we leave the armed forces, um, we, um, we are, are, are less attached to that label of veteran. I think here in the, in the US, um, it's, it's um, uh, more practical and more emotive um, to, to hold on to that uh, title of veteran. Practical, I say so, because um, you, you need that title in order to access the, the, the benefits and the services that the VA um, provides. And, 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 uh, and emotionally, and I think that that's um, uh, an important factor, I think that I don't know. I don't, I don't know why it is. There, there are some different theories that I've heard. Perhaps um, uh, 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 I've heard theories that, that perhaps um, guilt after after Vietnam and, and the desire now for uh, the, the public to really show their support for, for veterans. Right. Um, that's one theory I've heard. But th there really is a strong um, feeling to, to hold on to and express that title of being a veteran. In the UK, um, there, there is, of course, an element of that, and that's, that's absolutely fine. We should, it is right that we should be hugely proud 
right. of our service. I'm extraordinarily proud of the time that I spent in the British Army and, and uh, I'm proud of the title of veteran, but there's less of a practical need to hang on to that, um, that, that title because once we leave the armed forces, um, uh, I, there's, a, there's a growing um, uh, movement, there's a statement that, was, that, that I heard in, in Parliament um, from I think Johnny Mercer MP, uh, MP for Plymouth said it uh, a while back, you know, wouldn't it be great if we don't focus on trying to make good veterans It'd be better if we try and focus on making great citizens, mm. and I think that that is a, that's a that's a, a, a positive outlook. On the practical side of things, in the UK, we've got a a, um, a welfare um, system, which means that our, uh, everyone gets free um, healthcare um, and uh, and the like. So there is less requirement for uh, for that VA. Um, there are arguments that perhaps. Um, because we don't have that single point of contact uh, within the within the within government, that there is a chance that people have to go bounce around different departments. But 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 on the whole, um, uh, I think culturally uh, uh, we, we are um, similar in many ways how we view our veterans. But in in, in other ways we're, we're different. I heard you speak, and you said you were somewhat alarmed at the um, at how many homeless veterans there are in the United States. That's not the case in the UK. I, I, I don't have the exact figure, to be honest. And um, I've been asking around uh, the UK with different um, uh, uh, veteran service organisations, and actually, um, it's a figure that no one can be 100% sure on. Um, uh, not even the ratio of, uh, of of veterans who 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 are homeless. I was, I, I you know, you're quite right, Jeff. Um, uh, I've just come back from from Los Angeles. And the level of overt homelessness in that city and, 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 and around the country, actually, is, is shocking for me as, as a visitor uh, to this fantastic country. Um, and uh, I believe the figure in, in Los Angeles, I was told, was, was 3,500. Wow. 3,500 veterans that are homeless. That are homeless. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I was shocked by that, 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 people, can, um, that people can fall that hard mm -hmm. um, after serving their country. Um, as I say, I don't know exactly what the what the figure is mm -hmm. in the UK, but I can guarantee proportionately it's nowhere near that figure. Well, why do you think that happens? Why do you think veterans fall into that state? I genuinely don't know. I genuinely know, don't know. But I do know that um, for the for the majority, for the vast majority of of people who serve in the armed forces. That experience is a positive and life-enhancing experience. Um, I've 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 read an article today in USA Today that that, that I that I thought was 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 um, quite damaging. I, I can't remember the exact headline, but it was talking about how uh, it was pointing out how the the last two um, uh, uh, guys who've been involved in the shootings with with police officers. Um, in, in, in recent days, have both been veterans. Mm -hmm. Now, I wonder if they'd both been plumbers, or they'd both been electricians, or they'd both been nurses. Would, would that connection have been made? Right. Would that have been highlighted? I, I don't think it would. And I, I genuinely think that there's this discourse, this belief that, um, that it's a natural progression um, that, that service in uniform equates to um, a damaged good. And I would like to, I'd like to discount that. I would like to discount that. I think for most people, service is a positive, uh, a positive experience and a life-enhancing experience. Tell me about your experience in Afghanistan. You were wounded, as we mentioned, in the open. Tell me the story. That's right. Um, I, um, uh, it was my second tour. Um, uh, I, was, uh, I was in Helmand province, in southern Afghanistan, close to the Pakistani border. Um, on this uh, tour, uh, I was in command of a very small um, but specialist uh, group of soldiers. Uh, our, our specialism was to um, live amongst and fight alongside the Afghan National Army uh, as a team of mentors. Um, and um, we had done that, uh, and done that fantastically well. I, I studied, uh, I did some uh, courses in anthropology when I was at university, thoroughly enjoyed um, studying other cultures and therefore to live um, amongst 
the uh, the, the Afghans uh, was 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 fantastic for me as a, as a as a mini ethnographic study. Um, but it, it, 2009 was a very busy year for uh, the British Army. Um, it was our bloodiest year um, in 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 that conflict, and uh, uh, we lost we lost a lot of men that year, and, and uh, uh, I lost uh, a lot of friends either killed or, or wounded. In fact, in an extremely busy three-week period at the end of 2009, my small team, we, there were just nine of us, we dealt with, with 25 um, different casualties, um, a mixture of um, British Army, um, Afghan National Army, and, and indeed civilians as well. And um, it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very sad to say that five, five of those 25 um, people didn't didn't make it back. Five um, British British Army soldiers didn't didn't return. Um, and on the fifteenth of November in two thousand and nine, um, I became the twenty sixth casualty that our um, small team had to deal with. Um, we had been involved in um, uh, uh, our battle group had been involved in a, in a in a battle to push the Taliban north, just eight hundred meters. <laughs> Um, and that, that took two days um, to achieve that. And what we'd done is we'd created this, this space that then needed to be defended. Um, the, the, you know, so otherwise the Taliban, the enemy, could have re-infiltrated that ground and that fight would have been in vain. So we, um, uh, we were to conduct a number of fighting patrols over that ground. Uh, in order to establish contact with the enemy and really pick a fight and push him off that ground and, and just reinforce the fact that, that, that it belonged to us. Um, on the 15th of November uh, 2009, um, we, we set off um, uh, my small team and, uh, and a group of uh, Afghan soldiers as well. We set off um, and we heard over there, we can, we can tap into the, 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 um, the Taliban radio um, and we can hear them saying they're going to bring up the big stuff, they're going to contact in the next field, we're going to you know, kill these guys. And so it really was quite an eerie experience to, to hear all this and the, and the, and the tension building. And, um, and I remember we were sitting in a ditch, me and my corporal Barney, and uh, we were just having a smoke. And Barney said, you know, we could, we could turn left here and we'd be back at the base in five minutes. And we both looked at each other and we knew that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so we put out our cigarettes and went, come on, Barney, let's, let's just do this. We stepped into the next field and the world erupted. Um, uh, rounds were coming in, not on my position, but on the, on the section ahead of me. And they were under some heavy contact from over on my right-hand side. So the rounds were coming um, uh, across in front of me. Um, and then a second firing position opened up directly in front of me, about 200 meters in front of me, 250 meters in front of me. I heard a round just whistle past my head um, with a, that distinct crack as it went very close to my head. And the second round slammed into my shoulder just here wow. um, because I was very low to the ground, almost parallel to the ground. That round sort of came in at this trajectory, hit my shoulder traveled the length of my torso, hit my back ribs, hit my front ribs, and then came to rest um, in my right lung. Uh, as it went through, it nicked the axial artery that runs sort of parallel to your um, collarbone. So that was bleeding into my chest. Um, there was a sucking chest wound as, as I was trying to breathe in because this lung was shredded. Actually, air was being drawn in through the bullet hole. Um, and, uh, and so I was uh, in, in pretty bad shape because my chest cavity was filling with both air and blood in a condition called a pneumohemothorax. And if it's not drained pretty quickly, um, you, you end up just suffocating mm -hmm. as, your, as, your, as your, my good lung um, couldn't open. Um, thankfully, an American helicopter, uh, a Pedro call sign, uh, was flying over. And, uh, and came down, even though it was still, as, as you guys call it, a hot LZ, a hot LZ, sorry, <laughs> I'll get it right, I'll get it right. A hot LZ, there was still loads of rounds coming in, um, a heavy contact. Um, those guys had the guts to land on and, and pick me up, um, drain my chest in the back of the helicopter, which is a very unpleasant experience without sure. anesthesia. <laughs> um, um, but uh, after a pretty bad day at the office, um, it all turned out okay. 
Tell me, after, after the experience, you wrote a book. What's the book about? What's the, what's the purpose of the book? So it was never meant to be a book, actually. Um, so uh, if you do read it, forgive me if there is a sort of a common thread going through. But it's called Helmand to the Himalayas. Um, as I say, it was never meant to be a book. I, I, when I came back, I just had so, my head was so busy. My head was just full of stuff. And it, and it had to come out. It, it, so it really was sort of a cathartic experience for me to, to write. Um, and, uh, and I just unloaded everything from my head on, onto the pages. Um, and uh, and that, that, became, that became this book. It's called, it's called Helmand to the Himalayas because, uh, as I say, the story starts in Afghanistan, in Helmand province, um, uh, where I was shot. And I guess that the arc, that the message that, 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 that sort of pervades through the book is one of recovery mm. and one of um, turning a negative situation into something that's positive. We hear a lot about post-traumatic stress and that is an issue. It's a real issue, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. um, I've had experience of it myself being shot in Afghanistan, what certainly wasn't the worst experience that I went through in that, in that country. Um, uh, I'm sure that anybody that has been wounded um, would say, you know, seeing other people wounded or other people killed is far worse than it happening to yourself. Um, but I believe that post-trauma, there is also opportunity for growth. You know, um, you get to know yourself very, very well, yeah. um, as uh, a lot of those thoughts um, pre-trauma post-trauma, a lot of those thoughts become pretty introspective um, as you start thinking about, um, about your own mortality um, about, and you've, you've, you've really got to think about your own thought processes as well as you, as, uh, um, as, as you recover. And um, I, I do think there is an opportunity for growth um, after trauma. I personally um, started to understand my own priorities. Um, I started to see opportunity everywhere. And not only that, but also had the guts to seize that mm. opportunity, having realized that, you know, and, and, and having a, a stark lesson that life is pretty blumming short, actually. Mm. And so if you don't seize the opportunity now, there may not be the chance tomorrow. But it, the, sorry. The, well, I was going to say, and, and you're spreading this message now working with Prince Harry, right? Mm -hmm. To help other uh, wounded veterans. Tell me more about that. Okay. so. Um, that, this came about um, because of my experience in the Himalaya. Um, after, um, after wounding, um, I, um, I was sitting in hospital in the intensive care unit in Birmingham, and uh, a friend came in to see me, and he told me about um, an experience he was involved with, and Prince Harry was involved in this as well. Um, there, was he, there was Martin, who'd been shot in the chest himself and was paralyzed down his right side. Um, there was uh, Guy Disney, he'd, been, uh, he'd lost his leg in an RPG strike, uh, rocket, rocket propelled grenade strike. Um, Jacko Van Gas, he'd lost his arm again with an RPG. And Steve Jones, who'd um, broken his spine when a bomb went off underneath his vehicle and he was told he'd never walk again. Those four characters thought that they'd formed the perfect team um, to reach the North Pole. A lot of people told them they couldn't do it and they laughed at them. They thought, you know, we're not going to be defined by our injuries uh, and we're not going to be defined by things we can't do. We're going to push on and we're going to reach the North Pole and prove to ourselves and everybody else that um, there is, you know, life um, after you've been wounded and that beyond injury, you can still achieve the extraordinary. And I took that message and that message was uh, hugely inspirational for me in my own recovery, and I focused my own recovery um, on expeditions to the Himalaya. 18 months um, after um, nearly dying in a ditch in Afghanistan, we had just climbed the highest mountain in Italy, Gran Paradiso, um, and we were standing atop the eighth highest mountain in the world, 8,163 meters above sea level. Um, and it was extraordinary, it was a life-changing moment for me. The next season we went and we attempted Everest. Um, it was a failed attempt at Everest, but the whole experience was extraordinary. And I felt that what Martin had delivered to me in that message of motivation 
um, I wanted to pass on to others. Yeah. I'd left the army um, and uh, was invited to apply for a job at the Royal Foundation of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and Prince Harry, looking after um, uh, a project called the Endeavour Fund. Now, the Endeavour Fund exists to support the ambitions of wounded, injured and sick service personnel and veterans in the UK to use uh, sport or adventurous challenge to catalyze their recovery in the same way that Martin had in the North Pole, in the same way that I did in the Himalaya. And I just thought, this is it. This is the way in which we can spread that message and uh, 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 to the wider community. And what, what came out of that? So um, we've been going for about three years. We've supported 34 different um, challenges. Some of these have been really small and community. We've, we've just set up a, um, a, uh, a running club in Birmingham. And some of them, some of them being pretty big, actually, Jeff. <laughs> um, I remember coming over to Colorado Springs with Prince Harry in, in 2013. And um, we, went and we went and called in on the Warrior Games, the DOD Warrior Games over in Colorado Springs. And all of us that were there, including Prince Harry, were inspired by what we saw. Um, those guys from your wounded community um, competing against each other in, 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 uh, in, in, in decent level competi competitive sport. It was fantastic. And Harry said, we're going to take this idea and we're going to take it back to the UK, but we're going to make it massive. I want it at the Olympic Park in London. I want it international. I want it on TV. I want everybody to share in this message. This shouldn't just be for this military community. It should be for everybody. Yeah. So we went back. And that was May 2013. And in September 2014, so just a, a little over a year later, we welcomed 14 different nations, 417 athletes from, from across the world to come and compete in nine different sports, swimming, cycling, track and field, uh, wheelchair rugby, wheelchair basketball, loads of different sports, uh, came to the Olympic uh, Park in London and just blew everybody's minds it didn't matter if you were military civilian had nothing to do with the military at all you couldn't deny that there was 417 people who were standing up and showing the world that they were not going to be defined by their injuries wow incredible and it just continues to grow well, it, we were fantastically hosted here in Florida. Right. In uh, Orlando, right? In Orlando, in, uh, in May just gone. Um, I think it rose to uh, uh, around about 500 athletes this year. We, uh, uh, we invited, or you guys invited another country over, so it's growing, 15 different nations, um, 10 different sports this time. And, uh, and, and I was hugely honored to have been asked to be the, the, the captain of the UK Armed Forces team. So I was honored to bring my team across uh, to your state, to your country to compete. In, and we're talking about the Invictus Games. The Invictus Games. Right. It's drawn from the, from the poem by Henley, um, which talks about um, uh, lines such as, my, my head is bloodied, but, un, but not, uh, my head is bloody, but not, um, uh, but unbowed. Um, it talks about being uh, uh, the master of my faith and the captain of my soul. It's stirring. It talks about recovery. It talks about being resilient. It talks about never giving up. Who has most influenced you in your life? That's a big question, Jeff. And I think at different parts of, of your life, you draw inspiration from, uh, from, from different people. And I don't think that there's been one person. I've been really fortunate to have um, been surrounded by really good people in my life. And, and I'm not ashamed to say I've lent on a lot of different people at a lot of different times. Um, um, I don't see it as a form of weakness to stick up your mitt and say, hey, I need some help with that, with this. I see that as a, a position of strength. And I would encourage anybody who is having difficulties, it doesn't matter if you're a veteran, doesn't matter if you're a civilian, to actually um, stick up your mitt and, uh, and say, hey, can I have some help with this? Yeah. Yeah. What is the most important message that you can send to someone, whether it's someone who has been injured or maybe it's just someone who's, who's down and out, but from all the experience that you've had and all the challenges that you've had, 
and all the experience that you've had with people who are facing great challenges, what message do you want to send to the average ordinary person? So I've got, I've got a few. I haven't got one, I'm sorry. Uh, and I've got, if, only if got about was, three minutes. Okay, so. one is that with any injury, there will always be a physical, a social, and a psychological impact. It doesn't matter if you've been in a car accident, if you've been shot in the chest, or if you've been diagnosed with cancer, there will always be a physical, a social, and a psychological impact. Sport is an amazing tool, a powerful tool that targets physical, social, and psychological impacts of injury. And therefore, if you, if you want to get involved with something that, that will help you in your life, get involved in sport, get, be part of a team, and be active, and, uh, and you really will see the positive effects. The second one is, it relates to my last point. Do not be ashamed. Do not be ashamed to ask for help. Do not be um, uh, uh, disabled by um, negative perceptions about mental health, for example. Um, we all have mental health. Mental health isn't just when you have a problem or issue. Right. Mental health is what we always have. And, uh, and you need to look after that as much as you look after your body. Right. And I know the Royal Foundation, as I understand it, has started a new campaign to work on mental health. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Right. It's called Heads Together. Okay. Um, and the aim of that campaign is really to change how we think and talk about mental health. Let's change that conversation. Let's not just have that conversation about mental health when somebody's having a problem. Let's understand that, that mental health is something that we all have and something we need to maintain in the same way we maintain our physical fitness. And I guess, and, and, and I only have about a minute, but I guess I'd be remiss without asking this, what is it like working with the Dutch, or excuse me, with uh, Prince William and, and, and the, the entire royal family? It must be a neat experience, it, 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 Prince it, Harry. It's a real privilege, it's a real privilege. And, um, and, I've worked mainly with Prince Harry, and I can I can just say this one thing, and and and, and, and especially about the Endeavour Fund and and the Invictus Games, um, his um, passion and his drive for um, matters pertaining to the armed forces community. It's not a facade. It's 100% genuine. It's something he's 100% committed to, and that drive and that passion is infectious. Fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for your time. What Thank you very much for having me on today, Jeff. You bet. My pleasure. David Wiseman doing great work in the UK and the United States, and for that matter, around the world. By the way, you can see more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations. We're also on Facebook and YouTube. If there's a particular show you like, well, feel free to share it via social media. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take wonderful care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.